the life cycle of a star is, is entirely defined by one thing, and that's the mass of the star, uh, and mainly the mass of the star when it's born. So the Sun is a fairly typical star. We talk about it as an average yellow type dwarf star in particular. Um, when it was born, it, it formed in a, a large gas cloud. That gas cloud collapsed down. The central region of the gas cloud became very, very hot and very, very dense. And eventually it became hot enough and dense enough that nuclear fusion took place. Nuclear fusion is basically just a crushing together of hydrogen nuclei to make a helium nucleus. And in the process of doing that, the sun is losing roughly 4 million tons of mass per second. So it's on a, a fairly dramatic crash diet. And that 4 million tons of mass that's lost every second goes into the equation E equals mc squared, so the one equation that most people know about, Einstein's famous equation for energy and mass. You put 4 million tons a second in as the m, as the E equals mc squared, uh, multiply m by c squared, the speed of light squared, and you get an enormous number. So if the sun loses 4 million tons of mass per second in its nuclear fusion reactions, that's enough to power the whole sun. Now, bigger stars, bizarrely, live shorter lives than the sun because even though they have more fuel available, they consume it at a much, much faster rate. So if the sun is losing 4 million tons of mass per second, a star that's maybe 10 times that mass will be living a, a life that's a thousand times shorter than the sun. It consumes its fuel at a dramatically higher rate. So the mass of a star determines how long it's gonna live. A star like the sun has enough fuel to last about nine or maybe 10 billion years, nine or 10,000 million years. And the sun is now about 4.6 billion years old, so it's just over halfway through its life probably. But no concern for us on Earth, it'll be another three or four billion years before we notice the sun undergoing any sort of dramatic changes. So it's a fairly average middle-aged star right now. But as I said, stars that are more massive have much, much shorter lives. So uh, a star that weighs maybe a hundred times the mass of the sun, so some of the most massive stars that we see out there in the Milky Way galaxy, may have a lifetime of only a million years. Now, to a human, that's a long time, a million years. But for a star, where we're typically talking thousands of millions of years, that's a very, very short life. Now, the mass of a star doesn't just determine the lifetime of the star, how long it's going to survive. It also determines the way in which it dies. So a star like the Sun will undergo what's called a, a red giant phase. In about 9, maybe 10 billion years, it will swell up to roughly the size of the Earth's orbit. So the Sun will expand and get dramatically bigger. It will engulf Mercury, engulf Venus, and reach a roughly the point in the solar system where the Earth currently is. But of course, as the Sun is losing mass all the time, it has less gravitational pull. So the planets are slowly drifting away from the sun. The sun weighs less, so it has less gra gravitational pull. The planets drift away. So at the point at which the sun reaches the Earth's orbit, the Earth won't be there anymore. It will be further away. It will have drifted outwards. And Mars may then be the place to look at for habitation because Mars will then be a warmer, wetter, hopefully, place. So you know, if there are humans around in four or five billion years, maybe that's where they'll be. Um, the sun will undergo a period of instability. It will swell up and contract and swell up and contract, and eventually it will just sort of lose contact with its surface. It will expand one too many times and become what's called a planetary nebula, so a very large extended cloud of material that drifts off into the universe at a speed of three or 400 kilometers per second. So again, very fast for a human, but fairly slow in astronomical terms. And what it leaves behind is an object called a white dwarf. Now that's an object that weighs maybe half the mass of the Sun up to a maximum of 1.44 times the mass of the Sun, um, but it's about the size of the Earth, 10, 15,000 kilometers in diameter. The more massive stars undergo much more dramatic deaths. They have a very short lifetime, and when they die, they swell up to enormous sizes, not just the size of the Earth's orbit, but somewhere out between Jupiter or Saturn's orbit, and we call those supergiants. So these supergiant stars are extremely large, extremely unstable, and all the activity is really going on in the, in the core, in the central region, where these, these frantic nuclear fusion reactions are taking place. Now, just before a star dies, a massive star dies, it's converting elements not from hydrogen to helium, but from helium to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, all the way up the periodic table to the element iron. Now, iron is, is the last element that gets created in the core of a massive star, because beyond that, you don't release energy. E equals mc squared is always giving you energy out. You destroy material, convert it into energy, and that powers your star. But when you try and do this with iron, with an iron core and a supergiant star, it requires energy input effectively. The system falls apart, the core of the star collapses under gravity because this thing is incredibly massive, and the star then becomes what we call a supernova. It blows itself to pieces. In blowing itself to pieces, it scatters out the chemistry of the universe back out, recycles it into gas clouds for the next generation of stars. So this process is absolutely fundamental to the chemistry of the universe. If we don't have massive stars, we don't have elements beyond iron in the periodic table. 
we clearly do have those elements, therefore there must have been massive stars in the past that have lived very short, dramatic lives, blown themselves up, and recycled their elements back out into the universe. We think from the chemistry of the sun and the planets and everything we see around us that at least two generations of massive stars have lived and died in our locality, in, in, in what is now the, the solar system. Because the chemistry of us indicates that there's enough material there to require at least two generations of stars to have been around before us. When the sun dies, it will be much more uh, less dramatic. It will be a planetary nebula. It will recycle carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, some of the lighter elements back out there. But the massive stars are the ones that generate the real chemistry of the universe. And they leave behind these really exotic objects, either a neutron star, which again is an object maybe one, two times the mass of the sun, but the size of a city, 10, 20 kilometers in diameter. So very, very dense, very, very unusual objects. Um, or black holes, which are obviously a very sort of well-known phenomenon. People know about the name, but not necessarily what these objects are. But those are produced in the death of a massive star. So stars are, are very, very important, very fundamental, really, to the chemistry of life around us. If there wasn't massive stars, there wouldn't be the chemistry that we have around us. There wouldn't be life. There wouldn't be the chemistry for life at all. So massive stars are important. We're all made of nuclear waste from these things, essentially.